previously we introduced this idea that all of the things that we've learned about so far, like momentum and forces, are going to have a similar concept with rotational motion. Good one. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is torque and torque is the analog of force or rotational motion. So if we said that force was equal to F equals MA, then torque is going to be equal to something times the angular acceleration. So torque is the analog for force. Angular acceleration alpha is the analog for acceleration. And then the analog for mass is going to be this capital letter I which is the moment of inertia. And so moment of inertia is basically How easy, or I guess how hard it is to make something rotate. And so the larger your moment of inertia is, the harder it is to make that object rotate. So there are, you can calculate the moment of inertia for any type of object. Uh, and the way that you do that is with calculus. So we won't be <coughs> deriving any moment of inertias in this class, but you might be given a moment of inertia and then asked to calculate it. So for example, if you have a sphere, and let's say that it's a solid sphere, so just like a ball, then the moment of inertia is two fifths m R where R is the radius of this ball and M is its mass. So the units for moment of inertia are kilogram meters. And the unit for alpha is radian per second squared, but you don't the 
unit radian doesn't have any, so it's not a unit like meters or seconds. So it's it doesn't have a like a measurement thing. It's just a measure of the angle. So when we multiply this I times alpha here, you don't really write the radian unit. You just write the unit for uh, the moment of inertia, and then you would write this as one over second squared. So that would make the units for torque kilogram meter per second squared. or sorry, second meter squared. And if we remember back to our units for force, the units for force are kilogram meter per second. So the only difference between the units for force and the units for torque are this extra meter term or meter unit. And so that is going to give us an insight into a secondary representation of this, of a new equation for torque. So any questions before I move on to that? Okay. So this, we have this definition of torque moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And then we saw that the units for force and torque were almost the same, but there was an extra meter unit. And so that comes from the second equation where torque equals R cross F. So R is just some radius or some distance. This tau is still torque. And this F is your force. And now this, I said cross, so this is a special kind of multiplication called a cross product. And it, has different rules than a normal multiplication, or we saw a dot product when we were doing work. And so this cross product is also going to have special rules for it. So if you want the magnitude of torque, then you can calculate that by taking the magnitude of the distance, the magnitude of the force, and then multiplying that by the sine of the angle between them. So for example, if you think about a a wrench, and you're trying to tighten some bolt, then if you apply, if you apply your force in this direction, And 
this is the direction from the force to whatever object is being rotated. Then we can calculate the angle between these two vectors. Maybe I'll draw it up here instead. And so the angle between these two would be 90 degrees. And so in this example, the magnitude of torque would just be R F sine of 90. The sine of 90 degrees is one. So this would just be the magnitude of R times the magnitude of R. So what this new equation for torque is telling us is that if we apply some force at some distance away from the center of some object, then we can rotate that object. Now, if we had instead, and maybe I'll do this in red, so what if we applied the force on the wrench in this direction and we were trying to turn the screw still in the same R direction? So just intuitively, if you push a wrench into a bolt, it's not gonna screw in, right? And so mathematically, the reason for that is that if you take the sine of zero, then you get zero torque. So just like a force is, and uh, as a concept is, I if I apply this force to something and I know it's mass, then I'll know what acceleration I gave that object. So a torque is the same thing. If I tell you what the torque on an object is and you know what its moment of inertia is or how easy it is for it to rotate, then you can tell me the angular acceleration of the rotation of that object. So this, um, equation you'll notice is just for the magnitude of the torque. And we haven't talked about the direction of the torque. So we're going to do this in one of the PLTL sessions because it's going to be uh, not, it's just something that you have to do for yourself and it'll be easier to show everyone in person and there's not a lot of people in class today so I don't want to try to teach it over Zoom. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a little bit. You have to speak up. Uh, so this is Newton meters. So those that's another unit for torque. So if we remember the unit for uh, a distance is meter, the unit for force is Newton. 
So that's Newton meter. But you can also write it as kilogram meter squared per second squared. Uh, but so the takeaway for for right now is that if the torque or the, the force is acting in the same direction as this R vector, then you get no torque. And if they are perpendicular to each other, then you get the maximum amount of torque. Okay. So now we have two separate representations for torque. So we have this equation and we have this equation. So if we, a lot of problems will give you for example, two of or three of these variables and then ask you to find the fourth one. And so basically what you're doing, so we this statement is mathematically true, right? Torque equals torque. And then on each side of the equation, we just replace our two different definitions of torque. And so now we have an, one equation with four variables. So if I give you three of them, you can calculate the fourth one. So let's do an example of that. So let's say, so we'll go old school, so a record. is so let's say it starts at rest what force needs to be applied to the edge of the disk so that it starts spinning at a rate Let's see. Let's say. Zero point two gradient per second squared. So the picture would be something like this. So here's your record has some radius r and it's going to have some mass m and then a a disk as a moment of inertia of one half 
m r squared and we're saying that a force is going to be applied here that's going to start the disc rotating in this direction so alpha would be that way force would be this way and our radius would point like that radius vector So if we come back to this equation that we wrote down, we now have something we can plug in for I, one half m r squared. We were given alpha, and then we have r f sine theta. So the angle between F and R is 90 degrees. So this will just be R F sine of 90, which is one. And then solving for force. So you see there's an R on the right side and there's an R squared on the left. So we can cancel like that. Then this sine of 90 term is just one. So it multiplying by one doesn't change the value. So now we have F by itself and F equals one half M R alpha. So if we were given some masses, maybe the mass of a record is like I don't know, 50 or 100 grams. So maybe 0.1 kilograms. And the radius is maybe a quarter of a meter. Then if we plugged all those values in, you would have one half times 0 0.1, and 0 0.25, times 0 0.2. And if you plug that into your calculator, you would get some small number, because I picked a bunch of small numbers. Zero 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 point zero zero two five inches. So any questions about this process? So you take your two different equations for torque, you set them equal to each other, and then that allows you to, if you're given three of these variables, you can find the fourth one. So that's, there's three kinds of problems that you can be given with torque. You can be given one where you're just asked to find or you're given torque. And so let's see, maybe I'll label this one 
two, and three. So in equation one, you could be given any two of these variables and asked to solve for the third one. Same with equation two, you could be given any of these three variables or any of these two variables and asked to find the third. Or in equation three, you would be given three variables and asked to find the fourth variable. Okay. So let's continue with this example and tie it back to the rotational kinematic equation. So uh, what we'll take from this problem is the same angular acceleration. And so you, let's say we have a record, start spinning. at an angular acceleration of 0 0.2 radian per second squared. How long will it take? for the record to be spinning one radian per second. So I'll write down our angular kinematic equation. So we've got Omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. Omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus two a or two alpha delta theta. And then delta theta equals omega initial t plus one half alpha t squared. So given these equations and what we're given in the problem, which equation would you guys pick to solve for the final or for the time? Yeah, so the first one. So we're given the angular acceleration alpha and we're told that we want the final rotational speed and then the kind of problem solving thing that we're given is that if the record starts, then we're assuming that it starts from rest. So omega initial equals zero. Radians per second. So picking the first equation, we would have omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. So omega initial was zero. Solving for T, we would take omega final divided by alpha. And then omega final is one divided by 0 0.2. And that's five. Five seconds.
So any questions about this process? So we'll keep going. So another problem that could be asked with the same thing is how many rotations will the record go through before reaching the speed or this angular speed. So now in these kind of problems, when they ask for how many rotations, uh, what variable do you think they're asking for? Yeah, so it's not necessarily clear, but this is a different way of asking for delta theta. So delta theta is your change in angle. And then once you know the angle that you've rotated through, you can convert that to number of rotations. So if I spun through an angle of 360 degrees or two pi radians, that's the same as one rotation. So if I had done four pi uh, rotations or four pi, my angle that I rotated through was four pi radians, that would be two rotations. So whenever they ask for rotations or revolutions, uh, they are asking for delta theta. So if we're looking for delta theta and everything else is the same from the previous problem, which equation would you guys pick to find delta theta. So you can use the last one since we solved for time already. I would pick the second one because we, what if like on a test, you might've calculated the time wrong. And then if you plug the wrong time in for the next part, then you would also be wrong. So, but you can definitely use the third one if you prefer. And so if we pick the second one, omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus two alpha delta theta. Omega initial was zero. The rearranging this for delta theta, you would get omega final squared divided by two alpha equals delta theta. And so delta theta is one divided by two times point two. So one divided by point four is 2.5 radians but remember we're not asking for the angle we're asking for how many rotations so we'll take our delta theta and divide that by 2 pi And we get 2.5 divided by 2 pi. It's 
something less than one rotation. Point, about 0 0.4, 0 0.4 rotations. Yes. Two times 0.2. Because the angular acceleration was 0.2 radians per second. And so somebody in the chat asked how this relates to torque. And so what can happen is uh, using these three equations, or I guess the first two equations, you can calculate torque and then find the, so if you have torque or you find torque, then you can find the angular acceleration alpha And then once you have the angular acceleration, then you can plug it into these kinematic equations to find things like your initial or final angular speed or how many, how far you've rotated or how many revolutions you've rotated through. Uh, so that's the, the interplay between the torque equation and these Angular kinematic equations. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so then the last thing that we can do with torque is called statics. And there are entire branches of physics and engineering that have to do with statics. And so we saw that if you apply a torque to something, you can make something rotate. But a lot of the things that we build, we don't want them to be rotating. So anytime you have multiple forces being applied, applied to the same object, you want to build your object or have your forces balance in such a way that your object isn't going to rotate. So an easy example we can do is something like a seesaw or teeter-totter. So if we put a known mass over here, M1, let's say that's five kilograms. And the distance between uh, the center of mass of this box and the center of the seesaw, let's say that's two meters. And now intuitively, if you wanted to place another mass two meters away, what mass would you put on the other side of the seesaw? So we'll calculate it in a second, but just from kind of using logic and common sense, what would you put? Yeah, you would put something that's five kilograms.
So let's check if our intuition on that is correct. So what we do is we've got a free body diagram for both of these boxes. So this box has gravity flowing down on it and normal maybe pushing up on it. Uh, but let's ignore the normal force for right now. So the, the normal force would keep the box on the seesaw, but it wouldn't necessarily keep the seesaw from tilting, right? So, and then if we looked at the red box, again, it would have some gravitational force pulling down on it like this. So if we have this force of gravity pointing down and then these different radii pointing like that. Now, if we look at the, so we're looking at the torque acting on the seesaw. So we're looking for the torque about this point on the seesaw. So we're looking at the torque here. Now, if you remember from Newton's second law, you had, so remember, as an aside, that Newton's second law said that we could add all of our forces together and that would give us the net acceleration of some object. So we can do the same thing with torque because torque is the analog for force. So if we add up all of the torques, then we would get I times alpha. So if our goal is to keep things balanced, so if this thing is balanced, it's not going to rotate. And so if it's not going to rotate, then what would the angular acceleration be of the seesaw? Zero. So just like with Newton's laws, uh, if we wanted something to not move, we had to balance the forces for torque. If we want things to not rotate, we need to balance the torques. So. The, so the torque from box one plus the torque from box two has to add up to be zero because we've said that the alpha is zero if the thing is not going to rotate. So we remember from our torque equation that R1 cross F1, FG1. Plus R2 cross FG2 equals zero. And maybe I'll do, I'll continue this on the next slide.
So what I have in the red box, I'm just going to rewrite on the next slide. So R1 cross FG1 equals R2 cross F, or sorry, plus R2 cross FG2. So R1 is, uh, we, so we were given that in the problem. M or force of gravity one is M1G. R2 is given to us. And force of gravity two is M2G. We remember that the cross product meant we could take the magnitude of these guys. And then multiply by the cosine of the, or sorry, the sine of the angle between them. The sine of the angle between both of these is 90. And so sine of 90 is just one. And then using some knowledge about cross products that we'll go over uh, in a little bit, uh, not, not today, but in a, on a different day, this second torque term is going to be negative. And so because that's negative, we can move it to the other side like this. And then in the problem, we were given that R1 equals R2. So those guys cancel out. G is just a constant. So those will cancel out. And you get that M1 equals M2. So all of this math is to show what you already knew from your own intuition of interacting with the world that if I want to balance something, then I need to put the same mass at the same distance on both sides of the seesaw. So you can have more complicated problems where you could be given two masses of different, two different masses and ask. So if I put one on this side, how far away do I need to put it on the other side? Or you could be given the location of both masses that's different and then calculate one mass given the other mass. 